The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to worship. Before we begin today, I have a few important announcements. Many of you experienced the wonderful live Christmas Eve service that we shared by Zoom. It gave us all a much-needed opportunity to see one another and to connect. Next Sunday, January 24th, Our Sunday worship will again take place live by Zoom at 10 a.m. There will be singing and prayer and preaching and fellowship, and there will be Holy Communion. Look for the email with the Zoom link or reach out to me if you have questions, and please help us spread the word. I also hope you will try out our weekly Sunday fellowship time and our Tuesday Bible study that also both take place by Zoom. Today is a special day. It is the day we honor the courageous witness of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The death of George Floyd and the waving of the Confederate flag by insurrectionists on Capitol Hill remind us of our desperate need for the courage and the justice of Dr. King. In the church, we remember that Martin Luther King Jr. was not just a leader or an activist. He was a pastor and a prophet and a brother in Christ. He was and is God's chosen instrument, calling us to open our hearts to the God who was oppressed and lynched and who went on to conquer the grave. On this MLK Sunday, we are blessed with music, prayer, and preaching from black Lutheran leaders in the Minneapolis area. Thanks to Church Anew, the local ecumenical ministry that has made this possible, you will get to experience the living legacy of Dr. King. The world needs the truth and hope that we are about to share. Come, let us worship. Well, have you tried Jesus? He's all right. Have you tried Jesus? He's all right. Have you tried? He's alright. I get joy when I think about it. What he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. In the morning, when I rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters And by your word, you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. 
And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. In Christ, we rise to new lives of justice, love, and freedom. Together we sing. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day praising you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
reading from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in before, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Word of God, Word of Life. The Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. My name is Kathy Spann. I am the executive director of Jordan Area Community Council. I am reading from the Martin Luther King Birmingham Jail letter. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that crossed my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine good, will and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I am here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. 
I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every Southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented. And when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outsider agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Amen. I am Reverend Paul Slack, the social justice advocate for Lutheran Social Service and a member of the Community Leadership and Neighborhood Engagement Board. I am here today to talk to you about the importance of Martin Luther King Day and what it means for us as a part of uh, the community of faith and indeed of the human race. As we remember Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the movement for racial and economic justice, which he and others embodied and prayerfully do more than remember in 2021. I want to reflect on a text of scripture and two texts from the civil rights movement. The text of scripture from Micah chapter six, verses six and eight. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah asked the most profound question for every person who believes in God, I'm a Christian. But this question transcends the particularity of my Christian faith and indeed is a question for all who believe in God. What kind of worship, the text asks, does God want from you? What kind of service do we owe the sovereign of the universe? God requires something from everybody who believes in and serves the divine. Micah gave a threefold answer. One, to act justly. Two, to love mercy. And three, to walk humbly with your God. 
Micah's answer to what does God want from those who believe, I believe is the answer that we all need to reflect on and live out. The two texts from the movement are, one, the letter from a Birmingham jail from which you've already heard excerpts, and two, the letter that preceded that, a call for unity. I mention these three texts because though all of these texts seem to have been written a long time ago, in a different time indeed, their content still frames our contemporary conversation when it comes to racial justice and indeed God's justice. The call for unity is a letter composed by eight clergymen, yes, men, writing this call to unity, who could only see in their response, their correspondence, unrest when the oppressed marched for rights that had been denied them. They were blinded to unrest when black houses were being bombed, black bodies were being hung, and black people had no rights to which white people were obliged to respect. They couldn't see unrest there. Then we have King's response in the letter from the Birmingham jail, where he told moderate whites that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor, but indeed must be demanded by the oppressed. And then we have Micah positing this question in that context, what indeed does God want from those who serve the divine? What is our role in this human existence where systemic racism runs rampant and wrecks havoc? Act justly, not just when it's convenient. Love mercy, not just for you, but also for neighbor. Walk humbly with your God. Our daily beliefs and practices and investments should be God-guided. Now that George Floyd's murder has awakened us, what are we going to do? I need everyone listening to understand that George Floyd, uh, before George Floyd, we had 14-year-old Emmett Till and countless others, countless others wrongfully convicted, countless others robbed, countless others underpaid, businesses destroyed by law enforcement, openly cheated, people uh, who were in black bodies openly cheated, their families destroyed, their wives and children molested, their right to vote undermined, property stolen, equal protection denied. But now in 22, 2020 and 2021, we have seen the murder of George Floyd. Let's act justly. By some miracle, Derek Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck exposed the ugliness and evil of racism. And we must look beyond that one ugly racist action and comprehend the depths of the racist system which took Mr. Floyd's life. That ugly, evil, racist system was around at the founding of this nation and continues today. In recent days, we've seen it raise its ugly head again. It was on the steps of the U.S. Capitol we saw evil raise its ugly head. That evil destroys some of our best minds, stifles our creativity, and leaves resources untapped. This racist system adopts wrong when it's white, male, and heterosexual. It denounces genius when it is black and is blinded to the brilliance and nuance found outside of those two extremes. We have seen Systemic racism, separate families, deny basic necessities for life, enforce dehumanizing codes that send black, brown, female, LGBTQIA2S bodies into servitude and chattel slavery 
even now. The racist system that orders our life is destroying us all. And God is calling the faithful to dismantle this evil injustice. My brothers and sisters, we need to stop calling for law and order. Why? Law and order is code for keep black and brown people in the place the racist system has determined they belong. Actually, it isn't just black and brown people. It's anyone who does not meet fit the ideal that this racist system has erected. White, property, heterosexual, male. It wants to, this system wants to keep everybody else in their designated place. That place is outside the halls of decision, outside the protection of the law, out of the reach of opportunities, unworthy of public investments. Laws are not written for the common good. They're written to support this system in which we live. There was a time indeed when I thought differently, when I thought laws truly uh, were written to protect and to provide a path for all to thrive. I've been enlightened, my brothers and sisters. Lawmakers don't intend to serve the good of all. Those who govern don't have an agenda that defends the right of all and afford a path for everyone to live in dignity and possess the means for happiness. The law has never been applied equally for everyone. That's what Dr. King was telling us, the powerful, have been escaping responsibility since laws existed. And the marginalized have paid for the sins and success of power since there was a law. Some, my brothers and sisters, if we're honest, are above the law. And others are the law's scapegoats. So let's drop the law and order code language. We need to recognize law and order as a tool in this racist system to control black, brown, indigenous, and marginalized. And that tool serves the idea of whiteness as the unchallenged idea. The church indeed must become a champion for systemic justice. Until now, the church has been complicit in this racist system. And not just the Christian church, Synagogues and mosques and temples and places of worship have operated inside the ugly, evil, racist system. God has given us a unique and particular opportunity in this time to change our complicity to injustice, to change and become courageous champions for systemic justice. We turned our eyes away in the past from the ugliness in this nation that has murdered and stolen and molested and cheated and marginalized community. The churches have seen the evil and at times have benefited from the ugly, destructive system. But now God is saying to us, God has been saying through us, through all of the events that have happened in 2020, and yes, before, but I believe particularly now, God is saying we have an opportunity to turn and stand for the justice of God rather than the injustices of our nation. Stand for the humanity that God has created. Stand for the good. Stand for fairness that God wants from us all. Stand with everyone who is in this nation. God, my brothers and sisters, have captured our nation. People who believe in God, the Lord is giving us an opportunity to embrace all of humanity. It was not human ingenuity that engineered a global rebuke to the actions of Derek Chauvin when he was, as a sworn officer, uh, showed utter discontempt, disregard, and inhumanity for the life of all black people. Yes, all black people, as he murdered George Floyd. The power of God caused us to see, caused us to grieve, the ugliness we've nurtured for centuries. God has indeed come among us. God is indeed 
calling us to see each other, to see the sacred image of God stamped on every person and to work for a common destiny of shared prosperity. God is requiring us, requiring us to voice a collective response to the most profound question of all time. What indeed does the Lord require of you, require of me, require of us all? God requires us to act justice, justly. Injustice anywhere, King said, is a threat to justice everywhere. We must act justly when my community is threatened and when everyone else's community, when everyone else's family, when everyone else's rights are threatened because injustice weakens and destroys us all. God also wants us to love mercy, to indeed love mercy mercy. Not just mercy when I've done wrong. Not just mercy when my family has participated in missteps and misdeeds, but mercy for everyone. God wants us to indeed love mercy, to be a restorative power, a restorative spirit in our world today. A sage once said that if we practice an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we'd all be blind and toothless. No, that's not what we want. That's not what we need. We need the mercy, the restorative and redemptive power of God for everyone in our world. But there's one more thing that God demands, that God asks of us, that is also to walk humbly, with our God, to ensure fellow believers, people who want good for all, to ensure that our actions, that our ideas, that our values come from the very presence and power and wisdom of God, to ensure that our love is not just for those that we see every day and on a daily basis, those whose neighborhoods we live in, but that our love reaches beyond our neighborhoods, beyond our communities, and reaches to every person, every person, every person that bears the image of God, and that's everybody, to work so that every person Every community has an opportunity to thrive, that no one is working uphill because the law is against them, but that we embrace a path to happiness, a path to renewal, a path to redemption, a path to unity for all of us. Walk humbly with our God. When we walk humbly with our God, we recognize and indeed work for every person to have a voice in this world for the decisions that we collectively make to name and shape what our future needs to look like so that we all participate together for the common good. We must not practice the same old tired system where we have to wait in some line for our time. But every marginalized person and community must be brought to the center of concern and connected with resources that promote life and agency now. Waiting has cost us too much. Convenience has crippled too many. Marginalized have suffered long enough. The church cannot afford to ask any longer for permission, cannot afford to wait any longer for someone to agree with it, cannot afford to operate within the same status quo. We must demand 
that hatred and racism in now. God has already told us what to do. God has already given us a recipe for success to act justly. Not our own selfish idea of justice, but God's justice. Justly at every moment around our kitchen tables, at our community events, in our state houses, in our nation, across the world. Love mercy. Don't demand that everybody pays the full cost of their missteps, but you demand that we all practice the forgiveness and love and restoration that God practices and that we hope for in our lives, in our families. Walk humbly with our God. Every day, we need to ensure that our thoughts, our actions, our community reflects the fact that we are indeed walking with God. And if we are walking with God, we're walking with each other. The call of us, the call of those who believe, the call of those who from God, of, for all those who want to do right, who want to focus on the will and power that God is making available for us today is to unite as the church for the common good and to lead a path for peace and a path for shared prosperity. Let's realize the redemptive reparation of God's love in motion by uniting in the spirit of Micah chapter 6, in the spirit of redemption, in the spirit of restoration, and be renewed as we're renewing not just our faith, but the lives of all those, everyone, every person, every community who is a part of the human family. Amen. Oh, blooms in 
am Reverend Babette Chapman, co-university pastor of Augsburg University, and we will now enter into a time of prayer. Some of this prayer will be an adaptation from Dr. King's essay on facing the challenge of a new age, written in 1956, but relevant for today. Holy and eternal God, guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. Oh God, you call us to unity as the church universal. You call us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. You call us to do restorative, redemptive, reflective work. Oh, in your name, oh God, we ask that you help us. Lord, I don't feel no ways tired. Lord, I don't feel no ways tired. We've come too far from where we started from. Lord, nobody told us that the road would be easy, but we don't believe you brought us this far to leave us. Oh God, today we offer a special prayer and gratitude for the life and social justice work of the late Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And also for Congressman John Lewis and, and the list of leaders who challenged in a nonviolent direct action way against discrimination based on race, color, religion, sexual orientation, and nationality. Hear us, O oh God, call to unity for the body of Christ gathered through the world, throughout the world, and for all servants of the gospel. That following Jesus as a public church, living out his calling every day, a calling to love and serve all people, proclaiming the good news and to support all people who strive for justice, equity, equality, inclusion, and peace in all the earth. Hear us, O God, for the well-being of creation, for plants and animals, for all that God has marvelously made, that we serve as wise stewards of earth, our home, hear us, O God. For those lacking food or shelter, for those who are sick and grieving, for those who are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and for those who are in prison or homebound. God, console all who struggle and suffer. Hear us, O oh God, for our neighborhood, for visitors joining us for this first time or returning, we give thanks that the gospel of Jesus Christ is virtually carried to the far corners of the world, a gospel of freedom and justice. Hear us, O oh God. We don't feel no ways tired. We've come too far from where we started from. Nobody told us that the road would be easy, but we don't believe you brought us this far to leave us. For the sake of defeating injustice, oh God, we pray for courageous, intelligent, and dedicated leaders who are calm and positive, who will do anti-racism work as police officers and firefighters, attorneys and paralegals, peacekeepers, military personnel, and for 21st century leadership in governments. 
with a commitment to provide protection for all, especially the most vulnerable and yes, the marginalized. Lord, strengthen us and give us your values and your wisdom, O oh God. Lord, bless us with leaders who somehow analyze the issues and press on with a vision determined not to stop, but with wise restraint. 21st century leaders not in love with popularity or publicity, but in love with humanity. 21st century leaders not in love with money, but in love with justice. Lord, bless us with 21st, lead, 21st century leaders who can subject their particular egos to the greatness of the cause. God, give us courageous leaders grounded in your values and your wisdom. Leaders whom the lust of office cannot kill. Leaders whom the spoils of life cannot buy. Leaders who have honor. Leaders who will not lie. Yes, leaders who can stand before a demigod and damn his treacherous flatteries without winking. Tall leaders, sun-crowned, who live above the fog and public duty and in private thinking. O oh, loving and gracious eternal God, in thanksgiving for saints who have gone before us, that their lives give us a vision of the gospel in action, we hold their names in our hearts as we say them out loud or we cry them out to you, O oh God. Merciful and eternal God, Hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
Our benediction is from the words of the Reverend Martin Luther King. He said, Lord, we thank you for your church, founded upon your word, that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but to go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until the day when all of God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity. In the reign of our Lord and our God, we pray. Amen. shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday, oh, oh deep in my heart. shall overcome some